what? Yeah, the waiters. Korean people just screaming at... If you were to go to a restaurant in Sweden or in Europe or anywhere else, <laughs> you would discreetly try to get the waiter's attention by perhaps waving or when they're close by, say, excuse me, would you mind coming over? Here, either you have like a button on the table that's going to make a sound in the entire restaurant and like light up your table. Yeah. Or you just shout, Yogi-yo! That's my name! <laughs> and then like hold up the bottle if you want anything else. If you want like a beer, another beer, you just hold up the bottle and wave it. I'm not drunk yet! Why? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, maybe they don't have time for being polite in a restaurant, I guess. Yeah. Maybe. I mean, it is efficient. But I can't do that until I'm a bit drunk. Like, I won't go into the restaurant and then just start to scream. <laughs> so if I'm not, if I do, if I just, I'm out for lunch and not drinking anything, I you have to settle for what you get. <laughs> I know, it's like, I guess I'm just too... I'm too much of a coward to <laughs> just like embrace the Korean screaming. A bit yet. Like, like screaming out your needs in front of other people. Yeah. Yogiyo, Bekju, Hanato, Jesio. No, that's not me mm. yet. I leave that to my friends. I like to think that our Korean teacher said that Swedish people are very like quiet. Friendly but quiet, but then when they drink, they become like loud and social all of a sudden. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's like I can order things at a restaurant when I'm drunk, <laughs> but not otherwise. <laughs> Okay, so this is the 11th episode, and today I'm basically... Mm -hmm. You're counting. That's so professional of you. Yeah, I know. It's in my resume. It feels like it should <laughs> perhaps do. <laughs> it's AK drama on your resume. <laughs> is that why you were doing this under a certain name? <laughs> <laughs> no, but... I'm basically hijacking this whole episode to talk about something that I need to get off my chest. Yeah, but we do that once in a while. Yeah. The theme today is K-Wave and race. Mm -hmm. And maybe you might feel that, oh, that's not very fresh to white women talking about race. Well... If you think that's not fresh, get off my podcast. Okay, so <laughs> it's your podcast. There's gonna... mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Uh, get off our podcast. <laughs> yes. Okay, so there's gonna be two parts here. First part, we're gonna talk about non-Korean people starting K-pop groups. And secondly, we're going to talk about transracialism. So, yeah. First off, when it comes to non-Korean or non-Asian people uh, starting K-pop groups, there's been a lot of controversy around this. One group that is well known is EXP Edition. Mm -hmm. I know that you, Dino, know of them. Yeah, <laughs> as a, uh, I have not listened to them. I have only had them as a uh, as an example in a course. <laughs> they was they were required yeah. reading, so that's how I know them. Mm. They debuted in twenty seventeen, and they are there are four uh, members. They're all American. Uh, three of them are white, and one is white, half white, half Asian. Uh, and the group is part of a project that was started in 2015 by Bora Kim. And the name of the group, EXP, stands for Experiment. So basically, she wanted to start this group of 
non Asian slash non Korean people and see how they would be, you know, what kind of comments they would and get. And basically, if there is a recipe for making a K pop group, if it's a, uh, if, yeah. like if it's a cultural expression or if it's a uh, more uh, like a commercial product. There is a small documentary that both of us watched on YouTube that is called The World's Most Controversial K pop Group. That is about EXP Edition, uh, if you're interested in watching that. Uh, well, spoilers, they received a lot of hate, <laughs> uh, mostly from international K-pop fans. Uh, they talked about the group being super cringy. They talked about cultural appropriation, etc. However, it seems as if a lot of Koreans like don't really care about this group because it's not very... It's not a huge group that a lot of people know about, so they don't care. Um, also, another group that debuted in 2020 was a girl group called Kachi, which is also, again, a non-Korean K-pop group uh, consisting of British women. One, one is Korean, actually, <laughs> but the others are white. And they have also received uh, a lot of hate. So, I when I watch Catchy and EXP Edition, I get cringed out too, both by the groups themselves and also like the reaction that international fans have to them. So, why? <laughs> why do I have that? Because I started thinking like, because first off, like the group. If the group was only consisting of members that were Asian American, then this like people wouldn't care. And that is sort of an indication of that K-pop has to do with race. Mm. I don't even know where to start. I have a lot of things to say about this. I mean, I get cringed out of K-pop in general. So um, <laughs> I don't think I have a bias here, but... Um, I think that firstly that this group is is clearly not as polished as other K-pop groups. Uh, they're clearly mm. not as good singers or as good dancers, and they don't have the production that uh, K-pop groups, like big K-pop groups, generally have. Uh, so of course mm. the expression is going to be lesser. Um, but then they had a lot of like positive fans and i think that like like any music if you like it you like it and if you don't you don't like what are you gonna do but the way that like all these international i think in that in that documentary there were three american youtubers who got to say their mm. who really like k-pop and got their say their part about this uh, exp edition um <laughs> and they said, I think that there was one man who literally said that he doesn't want any white people in his K-pop. Yeah. Um, he said, just a quote, no white people in my K-pop stay in America. And that's, that, that's Orientalism. He, he has his own image of what Asian should be like or what a certain cultural expression should be which he has kind of formed based on his own principles. And then he is projecting it onto Korea <laughs> and Korean music. And when someone acts in a way which is not according to that definition, he gets upset. And that is basically <laughs> Orientalism. Yeah, in international fans seems to have like a very weird and strong feeling of like ownership mm. of K-pop. Like these are my Koreans that are going to entertain me. Mm. Uh, which is just really strange yes. to me. And also the like my Korean friends who I've talked to, because a lot of people ask me why I come to Korea. And they are all, always quite happy to hear that it's not because of K-pop. Mm. <laughs> and um, then we usually have a discussion about like what K-pop is and if I like it or if I don't. And they usually said that they are proud that um, 
Korean music is like taking an international stage mm. uh, and that it has become so big. Um, but at the same time, it's like, it's just pop. It's just an other, like Korea has so many other bands and big genres, uh, like a thriving music se- scene. So this is just pop. Maybe not to everyone, but to the people I've talked to. My guy guess <laughs> would be that it only becomes K-pop, uh, like the symbol of Korea mm. outside of Korea. Because it's generally the only expression of Korean music that the West, let's say the West, not the world, because it's mainly the West and it's mainly America, um, gets to consume, right? Mm. I think that it would be differently if not only pop music was exported from Korea, but also like indie pop and Korean rock also took those or had those <laughs> billboard placings or whatever. Like then we would have we would have a diverse image of what Korean music can be. I mean, sure, but the music industry is about like K-pop sells. Pop music Obviously. generally sells, so... Obviously, yeah, yeah. But, I mean, K-pop could be a great gateway, gateway drug, if you call it that, <laughs> to other... You called it that, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we're like a gateway to other parts of Korean culture. I mean, for me, the thing that is like appealing with k-pop especially in the beginning when i started listening to it is that it's a new aesthetics somewhat new ideas about what is considered attractive or beautiful it's a different fashion and it just felt fresh for me to see non-white people being represented or like being the majority because you know in western pop that is not the case and i think that that is why a lot of international fans also feel like okay now the white people are gonna (laughs) come and claim space in like this genre of music as well but i mean it doesn't feel as fresh anymore or like as exciting i guess where i think that people I think that's why people are reacting so strongly to EXP edition and catchy. Mm-hmm. Like that, oh, that white people don't know where where the li- where their line is drawn between where they have privilege and where they should not be. Or, do you know what I mean? Mm. <laughs> Can't you just like see something interesting, take part of it, but not take over? Um, mm. Me and my fellow white people and our the history of all our ancestors don't have a very great reputation nah. reputation with leaving things as they are unfortunately i'm not proud of that but that is the case <laughs> to like defend these people the the groups exp edition and catchy like korean pop or k-pop isn't like something genuinely korean mm. Like, it has a lot of influences from hip-hop and soul. Yeah, it's not something that has resulted from, like, directly from the history of Korea. No, and I, I think Korean that, culture. like, that makes it even more, like, that the Korean in this is basically the visual expression, right? The production. Yeah. The, uh, the dance, the, the outfits. The cinematography. Mm. So when uh, when the the visuals make the K-pop, I think that's where it also gets more sensitive about who who is representing it, mm. who is the the outward faces. I don't know expression. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, one thing in the documentary about EXP edition, they talked about that they had gotten some like critique on their pronunciation. Or like that, oh, they don't speak Korean, which is like a bad thing. That they like make songs in English and then just throw in some Korean words here and there. It doesn't make it K-pop, but like, 
Have you listened to a K-pop song? <laughs> <laughs> they have English here and there. Doesn't make sense. It is not pronounced correctly. And even these days, there are K-pop groups, Korean K-pop groups that produce a songs that are 100% in English. Mm. And that is still K-pop. So, yeah, it's a difficult subject because it seems like it has to do mostly with people's emotions. Uh, and that is... <laughs> <laughs> never good <laughs> most difficult subjects are um yeah what was it a difficult question oh uh mm. one of those a serious, serious issue. issue yeah i mean the line between i've been thinking about this a lot recently like am i appropriating because like the the line between appreciation assimilation and appropriation is quite th- thin i think like you can easily end up in on the wrong side of the Mm. line and i feel like it also has to do with the person observing you (laughs) i try not to appropriate and more appreciate but who knows i don't think that anyone tries to appropriate or maybe (laughs) maybe they do (laughs) maybe some asshole is out there trying to appropriate it but <laughs> but I think if 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 you were to do that, I would say that then that's by accident by you not thinking it through. I mean, isn't assimilation just like a successful appropriation? Yes, <laughs> but appropriation is is using a cultural expression with the notion that you're doing it to represent it in a bad way. That is cultural appropriation, like. I wouldn't say that me wearing, sorry for this, for anyone who takes offense is not on purpose, but me wearing a kimono would not Mm. be cultural appropriation if I just wear it because I think it's beautiful. Um, Maybe I'll, yeah, whatever. Like I wear it because I think it's beautiful. I wear it to a, a ball or something, a student ball. But if I wear a kimono and burn the Japanese flag. That would be (laughs) cultural appropriation. Okay, so if I'm going to go to Korea, or when I'm going to go to Korea, thinking about like wearing a hanbok feels like appropriation to me. I wouldn't feel comfortable doing that. Mm. I mean, I'm not going to wear a hanbok because I'm going to look like an ass. It's not the the proportions just don't... (laughs) don't fit my body (laughs) i'm not gonna wear it because it's not pretty (laughs) (laughs) it's really pretty (laughs) i think it looks like i think it looks like the most comfortable thing you could ever wear while eating a buffet yes because it seems like it like it hits like for girls obviously Mm. because it's not tight around the stomach at all Mm. like poofy it's yeah, it starts to poof, like, right beneath your boobs, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. I mean, it is really pretty. I think that we have talked about this before, but, like, for my and your body shape, it's just not gonna... It's not gonna... It's not gonna fly. <laughs> I mean, I'm tall, and I have some muscles on me. I'm just gonna look like a six-foot pink traffic cone. <laughs> yes. That is just not... But But in a, you know, emperor outfit with a nice hat Petro, I mean the ladies are gonna go mad <laughs> <laughs> yes they would <laughs> <laughs> the K-Trauma podcast needs one of those glow sticks that's just for us so they can wave it while you're walking past while you're like strolling past with the hands behind your your back like a young that is actually is how like I usually walking. walk, so... Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> um. <laughs> like an old man. I would love to have, like, a Ajushi gang. Right. Like, talk about the war. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Sweden has not been in a war in over 200 years. No, not... No, I mean, Korean, like, older men... Oh, if you like hang, you hang with them and talk about yes. the Korean War, which you had they can absolutely talk about the nothing War. to do with. 
<laughs> is that appropriation? <laughs> Maybe I don't know. This is <laughs> this is a minefield. Um, it would just be fun to uh, have some older friends. I mean, I've talked to you about that. I always go to parks, and it's only me and the Ajamas. Yeah. So I might I might put together a Ajama crew. Ooh. Mm, you can come and visit, and we can eat some bread in a park. It's gonna be nice. Okay, so we're moving on. Now we're going to talk about transracialism. <laughs> that, that that's even a concept. <laughs> yeah. Ju- okay, ju- I'm not going to judge. I'm not just... going to judge because it has nothing to do with me. No, you just wait. <laughs> no. Someone that has become like very well known recently for coming out as transracial is a guy called Ollie London. Uh, and if you're into K-pop and like Korean culture you have not been able to not hear about this guy because he's been everywhere. Uh, He is a British man that used to teach English uh, in Korea. And then he, quote, fell in love with the country. And thereafter, he decided to have major plastic surgery to look, in citation mark, Korean. Uh, he is known to be a huge fan of BTS, just like Dino. And his main inspiration <laughs> for his plastic surgeries is BTS Jimin. Now I'm going to show you some pictures. You, you just compared. <laughs> That's so rude. No, <laughs> I'm just kidding. You like one of their songs and that's it. But this guy is obsessed. So he wants... I unwillingly. I unwillingly like it. Yeah. So here I have some comparison pictures of Ollie London and Jimin. And it's quite obvious. Yeah, I also wrote about yellow face, question mark. <laughs> because like the plastic surgery that he has done are... But I don't get how... He... I, I don't think they look alike at all. No. I don't the nose isn't the same, the lips are not the same, the eyes are uh, obviously not the same. Are you surprised? <laughs> Maybe it's like the like if I really really look on on just one picture, maybe the forehead. <laughs> mm. Yeah, so that is what he looks like. But he has done something to his eyes, right? Yeah, he has. It's just not apparent in these pictures. But I'm but no, sure I, I saw it in the pictures, and I think it looks scary. It's like he's taken away from his eyelids. Like it looks like he won't be able to blink properly. Yeah, uh, yeah. For a long time, I thought that Ole London was just like nothing more than a crazy fanboy that had fallen in love with a K-pop group and wanted to look like one of the members. but And also that he probably had some like self-esteem issues and mm-hmm. self-image issues. But mm-hmm. let's be honest, who doesn't? Uh, however, <laughs> he recently came out. He came out as non-binary and Korean. Okay. He is transracial. And his pronouns are they, them, Korean, and Jimin. So he went from being problematic to offensive. Like both to the transsexual community and to Koreans. Mm-hmm. I thought that we were going to watch his coming out video. <laughs> okay. Get me. Obvious, obviously, we're not going to put like the sound from it, but you can listen to our reaction. How do I... Okay, I'm just going to pause for a bit. Now we are watched a part of his coming out video. What? Yeah, you're shocked. It's interesting how he 
how a nationality could become a personal identity. Yeah, exactly. Just that is exactly like that. my first comment. That Korean is a Korean, as I understand it. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't that a nationality or an ethnicity and not a race? Yes. So he's trans ethnic then and not transracial. I, I, I have no idea about the definitions at the words. moment. I was, I'm just, I'm just a little bit confused. <laughs> um, I can, I can understand him maybe being like dissatisfied with how he looks, maybe being confused about his identity. And then perhaps he just thought that, like the people he looks up to, in this case it being BTS, or like maybe he had really like the best years of his life in Korea. So Mm. maybe that's his way. This is his quite extreme way of coping with his insecurities. It's like going back to uh, what he loves the most. So like on his per- on that on that very 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 personal and individual level I can see where it's coming from but <laughs> but I'm still confused <laughs> it's like yeah um, yeah it, it also like to take that step to to actually go Do through 18 like 18 plastic 18 surgeries plastic surgeries mm. uh for a concept like <laughs> like Korean as a concept that's that's huge that's like a country of I don't know how ma- how many people is it like 50 million individuals who yes have something in common since it's a culture but it's still 50 million individuals just by looking like a group of people probably doesn't mean that you're that you belong to that group of people no Exactly. I mean, it's like all of these, like I've read so many articles recently in like Korean newspapers about Korean adoptees come here and like want to know more about maybe their families or like the culture they come from. And they are treated very badly often, not always, but often because they can't speak the language or they are like... They look like them, but they are not a part of the culture. So, I mean, just that shows that just <laughs> it doesn't work. What he wants to achieve won't work. I think it's really sad. Yeah, it is really sad. And if he wants to feel whole as a person, it would probably be better to put all that money that he put into plastic surgery on therapy instead. I'm like, mm. sorry, but... Fixing your exterior is just a way to... I mean, the exterior is not the problem here. Mm. That's pretty obvious. So yeah, so to put like Ollie London in perspective, when it comes to transracialism, I feel like we have to talk about Rachel Dolezal. <laughs> because when I heard about her, that was like the first time that I ever heard about transracialism. So... That was five years ago. Uh, Rachel was blowing up in the media. Uh, Rachel is an American woman that at the time worked as a president for the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Uh, She also taught uh, African Studies at Eastern Washington University. But Rachel was born white but she claims that she was born in the wrong body and she now identifies as African-American and she is transracial. So what she has done to sort of obtain that is if making her hair, braid her hair or perm it very heavily. And she also wears dark makeup. Um, There is a documentary about her that I think is really good. That is called Rachel Divide uh, on Netflix, uh, if you're interested. And yeah, Rachel was getting a lot of hate for her coming out as 
not being yeah as as being black basically mm. um and i mean if i were to oh sorry did you want to no, say, finish say talking something. if i was to do like a a home-baked psychological explanation mm. it would be that like both perhaps this um was it was his name ollie yeah yeah and rachel they i mean in the in rachel divide it's very clear that she had her, her, she had a very troubled childhood. But then, when she grew up and hung out with um, African American people, she mm. was very happy. In that, like with them, they they became her family. Yeah, it was like happy years for her. And that's, I guess, that's that was what this Ollie experienced in Korea as well, and. Like humans in general want to adapt. Mm -hmm. You don't want to be the odd one out. So if this is a context where you either like grow up amongst certain people in a group of people and want to continue to be in that context and in that community, I guess that some people who are so desperate to be there, mm. Maybe I don't know what the triggering factor would be for you to actually physically want to change into and adapt into that sphere. I can't answer that. I don't even have a <laughs> a guess. But I think that that's where these two people are coming from. Like uh, people in general would probably like adapt into how people speak and how people act and how you like interact with each other. Mm -hmm these people just took it a step further which is sad because like that they would think that they also need to change their appearance to be accepted i mean um, i don't know as much about ollie as i know about rachel since yeah i watched a documentary about her but mm -hmm. it's quite obvious when i hear her story that she was born into a culture or like a group of people where she felt as if she was she didn't belong there and then when she found another group of people which was african-american people she felt like she belonged there but there was like this obvious uh, physical differences um so in order to completely feel like she belonged somewhere she had to do this yeah but that's what i think is so interesting it's like what makes you think that you have to change your appearance to totally be a part of a group? Because you have low self-esteem and self-image issues, I guess. Because, I mean, there are a lot of people hanging up with other ethnicities mm. without changing their appearance and still feeling like, um, like they're a part of the group or like a family or really close friends. I mean... I saw a short interview that Rachel Dolezal did with TMC Live where she was when they were discussing Ollie London. And I have an interesting quote <laughs> from her, something okay. that she said. Um, so she said, my message to the hundreds of young people who reach out to me constantly and have like self identity and self esteem issues are asking me. How do I be myself in such a culture of outrage on social media? And really don't want to be shamed or belittled or for being themselves. Um, my message is to be you, you know. Do what feeds your soul and makes you feel at home and at peace and that you know who you are. Uh, don't let anyone else tell you who you are. Don't let anyone steal your joy. So I feel like She's saying that like the issue with transracialism is social media. Mm. She's or at putting... least other people's reactions. Yeah. And she's also, it sounds like she's also making it to, out to be a um, something you need for yourself. Like, yeah. like an internal need in some way to, to achieve what you have always been. Like an essence. Like that you can have an essence of another ethnicity although you're white and that's mm, hmm, doubtful but like and then to blame other people around you that's like 
that's very contradictive, especially since, like, as we have talked about, it's probably like the circumstance you're in that makes you want to um, change your appearance. Then to talk about this kind of essentialism is, I don't know, a, um, a defense mechanism, perhaps. One thing that I think is interesting from this quote is that she says, don't let anyone tell you who you are, which I think shows that she's unaware of racism in a way, because like what non-white people are constantly facing in society is people or the system telling them what they are only based off of their appearance. And that she's sort of putting the individual themselves, that they're responsible for for fixing it. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> fixing stru mm -hmm. structural racism, which I think is just... I mean, she's even been a Black Lives activist, so I don't understand why she uses those words, because it's... Yeah, I don't know. I just got stuck on that and felt a bit... Yeah, I mean, I know what you mean. That is really problematic that in a society, especially in America, where racism is very systematic. Mm. Or structural, yeah. like, yeah. Yeah, structural mm. um, within the state, even, that a white person feels the freedom of moving between races as yeah, a, yeah. As, a, as something unproblematic. Um, yes, that that is very naive. <laughs> and um, Yeah, because, like, as you said, like, a very common argument for people that are pro-transracialism is that, oh, well, you can be transsexual, so why can't you be transracial? Because, like, identity, regardless of if it's about race or sex or gender, is a choice. But no, uh, you cannot choose your race. Like, in that, if that was the reality, then non-white people could choose to be white and therefore also gain the privilege and rights that white people have. But society doesn't work that way. I mean, that is fucked up. But that is the reality. <laughs> I mean, a black woman in the US, if you compare it to like Rachel, who was a white woman that chose to be black, if a black woman in America decided that, oh, I'm going to change my name to um, Karen, and I'm going <laughs> to post on Instagram and Twitter that I now identify as white, no one is going to accept her for that. And just in the same way mm -hmm. as Rachel is not going to be accepted for identifying as black. But she, oh, I mean, Ollie and Rachel are sort of an, just another indication of proof of the privilege that white people have and that they don't know where the, 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 the border is drawn. Like, this is where your privilege mm -hmm. ends. You can't just choose your race. Yeah. Mm. No. <laughs> I just have a final thought or a little message to white people. <laughs> if you find yourself attracted to a culture uh, that you're not born into, fine, like adopt the aesthetics to a reasonable amount, uh, make friends. Orange eyeshadow. Yeah, and gradient lips. Go for it. And yeah. Uh, like make friends from that culture, learn about that culture, the history of that culture, but understand that there is a limit to your privilege and just move on. Like understand that there is a painful history uh, behind the privileges that you have and just show respect to the people that have suffered because of it. That's all I have to say. Understand that race is a social construction. Yeah, that, that is probably that is basically what we're using, right? Mm. And don't be like, oh, oh. now I get so annoyed nervous. again by that. Like the comments on her coming out as black is the problem. I mean, obviously not. She should know, as she is in. I mean, in her own sense, a part of African American culture. She should know why her as a white person coming out as a black person is problematic. She should know that. 
Do you need to watch some? Uh, do you need to go onto Kian's Instagram again? <laughs> we all do. <laughs> At some point in life. <laughs> I mean, I certainly don't, but... <laughs> I mean, I think this topic is interesting, but now I've thought about it enough for now. Mm. Please, no more <laughs> Until someone else. Korea boos changing their name to... No, don't do plastic surgery and come out as Korean, please. I No. Also, could you have a, a name as a pronoun that's not grammatically yeah, of course you can't possible. but also pronouns are things you use instead of nouns and names are nouns yeah i know i know that so, you like... don't <laughs> okay sorry <laughs> that's just another level of yeah I know. i'm losing words now <laughs> it's the it's the grammar police <laughs> level in this uh, knock knock <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> I was talking to my uh, to my my Swedish friend on mm -hmm. the phone like recently and I was out shopping so I was just like getting some groceries and then I was going to get some uh, um, some mandos because there is a mm. mando place close to where I live and uh, then get uh, some coffee and then go home and study um, so I went to all these places and she was like yeah, before we hang up, I just need to say that I love it when you are out and about and shopping and talking to me because every time you start to speak in Korean, you sound so much more cute. You sound like you're cute. You're not cute in Swedish, but in Korean, you're so cute. Aww. No, not aww. You're cute. What the fuck? What, what, what does that even mean? Oh, cute. How am I cute in Korean? <laughs> I mean, Kore the Korean language sounds cute. In what way is 안녕하세요? <laughs> what is <laughs> cute? I mean, it's cuter than... Oh, hey, hey. Hey. Show. Show bro. Show bro. Bro. Like it. <laughs> What's up? <laughs> Anash. Because that's how I usually sound. <laughs> All the time. <laughs> For a while I had, I, I used to answer the phone with, yo, yo, yo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the reaction that I got usually. I just wanted to be more hip, but yeah. Okay, well, okay. So if Korean culture made you cute, like you're, the impossible, the impossible happened, maybe it can make me cute mm. too. <laughs> Possibly, and probably, like, just being here <laughs> infuses you with cuteness, obviously. But that's something I've started to do as well. Uh, maybe I've hung out too much with my Korean female friends, but, like, every time I go to a place that I find, like, cool or nice or, like, which you would note for yourself in your head, mm. like, oh, this is a cool place, like, but never out loud. loud. Now I always say, oh, it's so pretty. Oh, it's so cute. And then I hear myself say that. And uh, you vomit. need me. You need me. <laughs> if you're like, oh, that's so cute. I will be like, shut up. <laughs> that's exactly what I need. Thank you. Keep that to your inner monologue. <laughs>